talk about now the celebrated Richard on Edric Pavlova's conjecture. Okay. Yeah. And he said that this will be his first blackboard talk on this topic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right. Please. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Pleasure to be here. So, so we we'll talk about. Lewis conjecture. So before I mention the conjecture, so maybe just let me introduce some uh, basic terminology, which probably everyone knows, but maybe I'll just recall it. So everyone knows what a graph or hypergraph is, so <laughs> I don't have to define it. Um, so matching in a hypergraph. Matching is simply a collection of edges which are pairwise vertex disjoint. Okay. And uh, so that's the matching. And what's a proper edge coloring? So a proper edge coloring is simply a coloring of the edges of your hypergraph. So that no two edges uh, of the same color uh, intersect. So you can't have two, say, blue edges meeting in a vertex. Okay. So in other words, every color class is a matching. Say, your if you look at your blue edges, that's a matching. If you look at your White edges, that's another matching. So, so that's proper color. And uh, chromatic index, so for a hypergraph H, chromatic index of H is the minimum number of colors <coughs> in a proper coloring of H. So what is the smallest number of colors we need to use to properly color it? Another way of asking the same question is what is the smallest number of uh, matchings you can decompose your hypergraph into? Right? So that's the chromatic index of your hypergraph. So this is a very basic object. Um, it has a lot of applications. So for example, in graphs, in graphs there is um, Wiesing's theorem, which everyone studied. It says that if you have a graph with a G with max degree delta. So when I say graph, I mean simply a hypergraph which is too uniform. It's just a graph. Um, so we have a graph with max degree delta, then the Jing's theorem says the chromatic index of the graph is at most delta plus one. And it's at least delta, because if you have a vertex of degree delta, all these edges, they have to use different colors. So it's always between these two nice quantities. Uh, but what about hypergraphs? Not much is known in that case. It's a difficult problem in that case. Um, in fact, for hypergraphs, already, um, say, for when the hyperedges are of size 3, for example, the existence of matching of a given size is an empty complete problem. So it's not easy to <coughs> even, uh, if someone asks, what is, if there, is there a matching of this size, we don't know how to answer <coughs> it. And so coloring, of course, is more difficult because we want to hear the problem is to decompose your hypergraph into matchings with as few matchings as possible. So finding the chromatic index of, of an arbitrary hypergraph is, of course, even more uh, difficult. Right? Okay. And uh, so one thing to note is uh, in general, hypergraph matching problems have 
many applications. So for example, it was used in uh, the disproof of Elbrod's conjecture. It has applications in geometry, number theory. For example, in number theory, there is a result of uh, four green, many authors. Um, who show who used uh, a result on hypergraph matchings to improve bounds on gaps between prime numbers? So they somehow find a matching with some nice pseudo random properties, and so finding large matching would be equivalent to some um, improving bounds there. And of course, the one of the Famous results is a Rudolf's con resolution of uh, Erdos Hanani conjecture. On the existence of partial designs, where again you can somehow rephrase the existence of a partial Steiner system, for example, as as a hypergraph matching problem. So you, you can set up an auxiliary hypergraph, you find a large matching there then it would correspond to the existence of a partial design system. So you can define many of these um, aux auxiliary hypergraphs for these problems, where finding a matching would correspond to the existence of some structure. So it has many applications. Okay. So now let me mention the actual conductor. <laughs> I don't know what is the order of <laughs> using this <laughs> box. <laughs> this is a typical OK. And uh, so let, let's mention the conjecture itself. So it's a very basic statement about chromatic, chromatic index of hypergraphs. So Oh, before this, let me also introduce what a linear hypergraph is. So a linear hypergraph is simply a hypergraph where any two edges meet in at most one vertex. So you, you can have two disjoint edges. That's OK. But if they meet, they meet in at most one vertex. They can't meet in two or more vertices. So that's a linear hypergraph. So the conjecture simply states that if you have an n vertex linear hypergraph, then the chromatic index of this hypergraph is at most n. So that's the whole statement. Um, so before I say more, maybe. Um, more history about this problem. Let me mention the extremal examples for this problem because they are nice. So when is this bound sharp? You can take a complete graph Kn when n is odd. Ob obviously, you need at least n minus one colors because the degree is n minus one, and you need different colors. But when n is odd, you actually need n colors. Because one can just simply check, because it, you can't have a perfect match because n is odd. So you need actually n colors. That's, so that's one example. Another example is this very uh, strange hypergraph where you have one hyperedge of size n minus 1 and all these small hyperedges of size 2. There are only n hyperedges, n minus 1 hyperedges, and one big hyperedge, right? So total n hyperedges. And any two hyperedges uh, meet in a vertex. So obviously, we need to use different colors for all the hyperedges. So this needs n colors. And the other one is a projective plane. So here, the hyperedges are of size roughly root n. And you have any two edges meet.
and there are n edges, roughly. So again, you need to use, because any two edges intersect, you need to use different colors. So again, this one needs n colors. OK, so here are three different examples. Um, this example, the hyper edges are all of size root n, roughly. Here is a hyper hypergraph where you have one really large hyperedge and many small hyperedges. So it's kind of like a mixed one. And this is just a graph. So somehow this is in between these two, right? Here is just a graph. You only have edges of size two. Here you have one large and then many small edges. And here only hyperedges, like edges, real hyperedges of size of root. So, and not only this, but Small modifications of these examples also give extreme examples. So if you take this complete graph, you delete a few edges, you still need to have n color, uh, need n colors to color it. So this gives you actually an infinite large class of graphs here also. But the main thing to note is that they all have like different flavor. So we need to somehow handle all of these different types of uh, uh, examples. OK, so these are the extreme examples. Um, so there are several, uh, actually, in the literature, several different variants of this um, I think one of the well-known variants is, is this, the graphic version, it's called. Graphic version of the conjecture which is that if you take clicks, if, if you have a graph G, which is a union of n complete graphs, so G1, G2, G3, Gn, so that any two, so these are clicks, each GI is a click, and any two GI is made in, uh -huh, at most one vertex, then the chromatic number of this graph G is at most n. So this might seem like unrelated, but actually this problem is equivalent to, this statement is equivalent to this statement here. Um, what one needs to do is simply imagine these, these clicks as your vertices. Think of these as your vertices. And you think of vertices as hyperedges. So I'll tell you, I'll, I'll explain this more. So this vertex is in a bunch of clicks, right? So you just make a hyperedge where the elements are the clicks. So say if this vertex is in, is in G1, G5, G7, then that would be your, your hyperedge. So every vertex corresponds to a hyperedge. And the number of vertices are the number of clicks. The number of clicks are n. So you have an n vertex hypergraph. And uh, the hypergraph is linear because any two vertices, so any two vertices are in one hyperedge. Vertices correspond to clicks, right? So any two vertices meet in at most one point, one vertex. So any two vertices are in one hyperedge. So the problems are roughly equivalent. Um, <coughs> they are equivalent because under this reduction, and we are trying to show that the chromatic index is at most n. So we want to, if we show that the hypergraph can be colored with the edges of the hypergraph can be colored with n colors, so coloring hyperedges there is like coloring vertices here. So that's why, sorry, this is a normal chromatic number. Oh. I didn't say <laughs> chromatic <laughs> index. And that's why I think, you know, <laughs> yeah, this is a normal chromatic number. Because coloring hyperedges there is the same as coloring vertices here. Because vertices here correspond to hyperedges there. So, and you want to properly color it. So a proper coloring of the hyperedges there corresponds to a proper coloring of the vertices here. So if you show that n colors are enough there, that means that n colors are enough here. So
So anyway, this is a just an if there are many uh, equivalent uh, statements actually in the literature. Uh, so maybe I won't mention all of them. So let's for simplicity throughout the talk, I uh, with this definitely just because that would be easier for, for us to make the argument. So the hypergraph is linear, and we want to bound the chromatic index of the hypergraph. Okay. So now some uh, some history of the problem. Um, so. A trivial bound is that the chromatic index is at most 2 and minus 3. Uh, to see this bound, what we can do is we just we can just color the vertices greedily, uh, color the hyperedges greedily, one by one. Say you colored some hyperedges already, and now you're coloring uh, this hyperedge. Uh, well, how many other hyperedges can this hyperedge intersect? Because that many colors we need to avoid. So one can show that, I mean, if because of linearity, the worst case is when you have, say, 2n minus 4 other edges. So you can have a particular hyperedge is, uh, for a given hyperedge, there are at most 2n minus 4 other hyperedges that intersect it. So you need to avoid 2n minus 4 colors at most. Uh -oh. Why is that? Uh, yeah. So you want, can you So this bound? Yeah, 2n minus 4, why? Ah, 2n minus 4, yeah. OK. Is so if you take three? one uh, hyperedge, yeah. because of linearity, let's see where, how many other hyperedges can meet this guy. So the other hyperedges, they kind of have this structure, right? like this, so because of linearity. And if you want to maximize the number of other edges that meet this guy, you want to maybe take stars, edges of size two. That's the way to maximize it. And if you want to maximize it, probably you also want to make shrink the size of this hyper edge. So yeah, I think the worst case is, this is just intuitive explanation. But yeah. The worst case is if you take an edge, and then you look at the other ones also being edges, I mean, it's just sort of size two. Then you have here, say, n minus one, n minus two, n minus two, n minus two other edges like this, n minus two, the total two n minus two. Yeah, basically, if you want to maximize the number of they're just intersecting this guy. You want it just to be as small as possible. So you should the bound comes from the graph here, two n minus four. So you just assume they just out of size two. That's the that's the worst case. Oh, but if the middle set has size t, then you can have uh, n minus t but this is going out. Like edge is going out, then it's like t times n minus t, then it's maximized when t is half. Okay, so something. You're saying, okay, let's look at. Then you have n minus t edges going out. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's a product of t and n minus t, then it's maximized when. Ah, but linearly? Mm. Oh, no, no, maybe I, I was minimizing. <laughs> no, no, I, I agree with you so far. No? Well, yeah, no, I don't understand. I, I'm no, a bit I confused. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wait. So. Uh, we want to maximize the number of other edges intersecting this guy, right? So, oh, oh, m maybe you you mean the degeneracy? Uh, okay, like I think I take the small hyperedge. Yeah, I think I forgot to mention one thing. We want to order this in decreasing order of mm. size. That's important. So you take the largest one, uh -huh. take the second largest one, the third largest one. Do it in this order. Uh huh. That's important. Because when you're looking at a particular edge, and you want to see how many previous edges intersect this guy, uh -huh. all the previous ones have size at least this big, right? Okay. Because that's the order in which you're coloring them. And so this case doesn't happen. When you're coloring this guy, 
when you're looking at how many previous edges intersect this guy, then you don't need to worry about Indeed, you're right, because if you just do it in an arbitrary order, this is a problem. Mm -hmm. But you do it in decreasing order of the size. So do the biggest one, then the second biggest one. If there's conflict, then it doesn't matter. But do it in this order, decreasing order of the size. When you're coloring this guy, you suppose you've already colored this guy, and you want to color this guy, then I guess intuitively it's clear that you can't have too many of these uh, these big ones intersecting the small one, right? Mm -hmm. Because now the picture is you have a T set, each vertex, uh -huh. right, kind of occupies. Uh, you have to have at least this. There's not enough room. And minus t over t minus one times t, something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> okay, good point. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the trivial bound, and this was improved to three and a half minus two by Chang and Lola in nineteen eighty nine. And then Khan and Shaywood in nineteen ninety two showed us a fraction of chromatic index. So basically these are the main uh, partial results before. There are some other maybe uh, pa partial results, but the main ones are. Uh, I, well, there's one more. Khan, in 1992, showed that the chromatic index of the hypergraph is at most n plus little of n. So when n so he proved the conjecture asymptotically. Um, so that's a nice paper, 1992. And more recently, Faber and Harris in 2019 showed, showed the conjecture is true if you assume Edge sizes, if you assume the edge sizes are in some interval, like 3 and square root 10 or something. So if you assume all your edges are, because for the general conjecture, your edges can be of any size, right? Like as you can see here in the example, they can even be um, an edge of size n minus 1. So if they restrict, if you restrict the, si the sizes of the edges to be in this interval, then they can prove it. So is this regardless of the size of n? Like for all is was it for all n or yeah for ah uh, I'm not sure actually. Maybe not. Maybe I don't know. Good question. Maybe one question. The the three examples are the only examples that are known to be extremal, so uh, as I said, this no. example can be modified. You can take, delete a few edges, still the chromatic index is, uh, mm. okay. doesn't change. So th this one gives you a large, very many mm. examples. Okay. I Since think these are, these are not very resi resilient because if you delete one edge, then you lose one edge. So mm. every, there are only n edges in each of these examples. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think that those are the only examples. Yeah. No. Since none of these examples satisfy the <laughs> assumption <laughs> over there, so right, 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 right. Yeah. So, so, yeah, they, their uh, their result doesn't cover it. Yes, good observation because they even say c is much less than one, yeah. so it doesn't <laughs> cover the projective plane. Right. Okay, um, <coughs> but there are some. Um, so 
let me introduce some um, the, the, this theorem which we will use in the proof also, which has some nice consequences. So this between the spins of theorem. Which says that if your H is a linear hypergraph and uh, all edges are bounded, all edge sizes are bounded, <coughs> this is important. So you can't have edge sizes which are a function of n, so they have to be, say, at most a thousand or something. And max degree delta, then the chromatic index of the hypergraph is at most delta plus little of delta. <coughs> so this is kind of like a Wiesing's theorem, right? Like if you think about it. Because uh, a graph is a linear hypergraph. And edge sizes are bounded, max degree delta. And we got using theorem delta plus 1, actually. But now this says delta plus little of delta, so a little more. And this has some nice consequences. Uh, it, it implies that the EFO conjecture is true if we assume all edge sizes are between, say, 3 and some large constant k. Why? Because if your edges are between in this range, then your max degree, because your edges are of size at least 3, your max degree is like, say, at most n half. So this theorem tells you that your chromatic index is even better, like roughly close to n half. Is that theorem, de is delta a constant or a delta? No, delta is not a constant. Delta is not a constant, yeah. And when you say little o of delta, is it like as a function of n, uh, delta independent of n, or? As a function of, uh, well, delta we usually imagine that. Oh, delta as is a, a function, function of n. Yeah, I see. right. <laughs> yeah. At least the application is, yes. OK. Um, so. You can see that in this, but here, notice that the range is very small because you, this only applies when your edge sizes are bounded. So, as soon as you have an edge size which is function of n, it doesn't work with like this theorem. But nevertheless, uh, it will be useful for us in the in the proof. So, it's worth noting. Mm. One more thing to note is uh, if you, even if you change this three to two. So if you just say that all your edge sizes are bounded, say by some constant k, then it gives you, because the maximum degree is at most n, it gives you n plus little of n. So it gives you that if that the conjecture is true asymptotically at least when your edge sizes are bounded. Okay. Okay. So that's. All I wanted to say about the history. Um, now, the main main result is that so the joint work with John Gibb Khan, John Kelly, and We show that. The conjecture is true for all large n. Um, and along the way, we can also prove a stability result, which is which is the following. So, roughly speaking, it says that if your if your hypergraph is far from the three extremal examples there, in some sense then actually the chromatic index uh, can be improved. So if your hypergraph is far from these three examples, then you can decrease this uh, bound. But far in what sense? Uh, there are two assumptions. 
So if your maximum degree is bounded away from it, and at most 1 minus delta n edges of size uh, close to root n. So if you assume these two additional conditions, then uh, the chromatic index is bounded away from it. So for every delta, there is this. So that is true. So roughly speaking, this uh, eliminates your first two examples, right? Because the maximum degree is bounded away from it. So you can't have Kn. You can't have the, the second one, the degenerate plane. And uh, this condition, number of edges of size roughly root n, is less than n. That eliminates the projective plane. So if you're in some sense far away from those examples, you, you can improve your know, chromatic index. OK, so that's the result. Now, maybe I'll explain the proof ideas. How much time do we have? Roughly half an hour, right? <laughs> oh, 20 minutes? 25. 25 minutes. Okay. So the, the main observation um, is the following. So very roughly. Um, so our goal is to be able to decompose our hypergraph into n matrix. Right? So goal is to decompose <coughs> our hypergraph into n edge destroyed matrix. the hypergraph is linear, of course. So let us, uh, another way of saying this is that we want to be able to, so these are our metrics. <coughs> we want to be able to place every vertex into, into a match, or we want to be able to decompose. Uh, so if we, if we have a vertex V and it has some edges incident to we, we want to be able to place all these edges into matrix. That's what we want to do. Let's consider the case when you have a word when we has high degree. So we has high degree. Consider the two scenarios when we has high degree versus we has low degree. So when we has low degree we have n matchings here that we want to find. When V has low degree, it's less demanding, right? Because maybe there are only a few edges incident to it. So you, you need to place it into a few matchings. So it's less demanding. But when V has high degree, say close to n minus 1 or n minus 2 or something, then it's very demanding because you have to <coughs> place it into every single or almost all the matchings. So these are difficult to deal with intuitively. But the good thing is, because of the linearity of the hypergraph, there are many edges of size 2 incident to it. So maybe um, we can use these graph edges to kind of, um, and maybe some graph theory results uh, to, be, to be able to place this high degree vertices into matrix. So mm. that is the, the, the very rough intuition. Um, so let me give some more details. So as I said, uh, the problem is with the high degree vertices, how to place them into uh, uh, into matrix. So let's define. So 
for now, uh, to sketch the proof, let's assume that all edges are all edges have size bounded. Maybe say at most three, just to make things simpler. And then we'll look at the more general case later. So let's take a set U of high degree vertices. So the vertices in our hypergraph, where the degree is more than say one minus epsilon times. So where epsilon is some yeah, maybe let's take some gamma much less than epsilon. Something like this. So let's take this high degree vertices, so really close to n. So we need to somehow deal with these high degree vertices, right? Um, and what, before doing anything, let's take a reservoir. Let's select uh, edges with probability. When, when I say edges here of size 2, the usual graph edges with probability one half <coughs> to be in R. It's, we're just selecting a reservoir of edges, randomly graph edges with probability one half. We keep it aside. We'll use it later. And we'll see how to use these edges later. Um, OK, select these edges and remove R. Now, after removing R, in H minus R, observe that the maximum degree of this hypergraph is small, something like one half plus little of one times n. I mean, intuitively, it's clear because if a vertex has, say, close to n graph edges, you're select, you're removing roughly half of them. So then what's left is just roughly a half graph edges. Or maybe it can be a mixture of some graph, uh, hypergraph edges and some graph edges. But uh, in any case, in this case, you, you're not touching the hyper edges, but you're removing the graph edges. And like the other the extreme is when you only have hyper edges. In that case, already you have only a half edges. So you're not doing anything. But still, this is true, the max degree of n. In the very graphic case, when your vertex is only in graph edges, like roughly n, then you're removing uh, half of the edge. So this will be true. This is not obvious, but intuitive. OK, so you remove your r. You have max degree roughly this much. Now we are doing the bounded case. So you can color this. So color h minus r with now apply the pippinger spencer theorem, which we discussed. It says that if you have a linear hypergraph bounded edge sizes, then you can color with roughly delta plus uh, little of delta color. So you can color this with just roughly, roughly this many colors. OK. so. We color, we've colored all of our edges, except the edges of R. We have colored all of the other edges very efficiently, right? So let's say this is K for simplicity. Oh, I have a question. Yeah. So applying the Kipenger Spencer theorem that yeah. we did the Edge sizes are bounded, but we just delete the. Yeah, edges so here have I, I'm assuming for this sketch that the ah. edge sizes are bounded. But later I will I will mention how to deal with unbounded edges. We need a different argument for that. Okay. Yeah, to deal with the large edges. First, I'm, yeah. Okay, so you remove. Just to repeat, the key step is just you remove your reservoir R, then all the other edges. You use the Pippinger Spencer, you color it, you get, K, uh, you get a coloring with K colors. So now let's look at the color classes. So color classes have maybe some hyper edges, some edges. They look something like this. Right? So these are the K color classes. 
corresponding to coloring of H minus R. Okay, this is really good because we used very few colors, roughly half times n. But we still have edges of R that we want to color somehow nicely. Um, but the edges of R are just graph edges. So we are happy because we don't have to, in the graph world, we know how to color things nicely. So we are happy about it. And another thing is, as, as, as I said here, high degree vertices are problematic because we don't know how to, uh, you know, make sure that this vertex ends up in all of the vertices, right? So, okay, but we have these color classes and somewhere you have this U, the high degree vertices. Maybe these color classes don't cover all of the vertices of U uh, and we are not happy about it. So maybe U up here somewhere like this, U is like this, so U, U is this high degree vertices. Okay, so, but notice that uh, because a vertex is in U, it actually has many graph edges incident to it. A vertex is high degree, and because your hypergraph is linear, and the vertex is high degree, that's only possible if you have many graph edges incident to it. Right? A vertex in U has many graph edges incident to it. And half of all of those edges are placed into R. Maybe I'll, I'll use a different color for the R edges. So, so every vertex in U has many edges of R incident to it. And, and that's nice because then we can it just find one R edge incident to each of these vertices of U. And you can extend this matching using the edges of R and cover the high degree vertices. That's the part that we uh, worried about before. Like how are we going to cover the high degree vertices? But you can extend them because each of the high degree vertices has many edges of R incident to it. So you can extend these matchings to cover all, or I mean all but one vertices of U just uh, by finding, by applying positive basically. So it's not very difficult to do this. So we do this for all of your vertices. Just extend this to cover your cube. Like this, using the edges of R. Okay, now after doing this, what is left? Yes. How do we know that that extends the, match, the, the matching that we're building? Or? Okay, so yeah, the here uh, there are some details I'm sweeping. So these matchings, they are kind of pseudo random, which is um, they are obtained using this nibble method in a semi random way. They are obtained, oh. obtained in a semi random way. So these matchings are somehow nicely distributed. Think of them kind of like random matchings. Okay. So if you look at your hypergraph, and let's say, look at your, let's say these are your vertices U, okay? Now, your matching, so let's consider this matching, for example. This matching is kind of like random, and being vague here. And these vertices, they each have many edges of R that they are incident to. So there's kind of like a random graph here between this and this. They're just, uh, these blue edges, they're just of R, are like a random graph. So if you check Hall's condition in this random graph, things expand. So you can find the matching. Yeah, I was just worried that the, the endpoints might already be used ah, in other very, very like nice. So you're worried? Ah, no, it doesn't matter, right? Because we just want to, we just want to, we just want to find edge destroyed matchings. Two matchings can share vertices. Are you worried about matching sharing vertices or? 
No, well, you're extending a matching, right? Yeah. So every edge that you add to it should be edged you know, vertex to join from all the previous edges. Right, right. But maybe these. So you're working, not you're working only, so these are your matching edges that, yeah, you, yeah. that you want to extend. Yeah. So you're only working here. Right. But even in part. that region, you're guaranteed to have lots of edges at all? Yes. Okay. You can. I mean, there are cases. Yeah. If u is small, then what I said is true. Because uh, each vertex here, because uh, r is quite random, quite nicely distributed, because see, u has degree really close to n, mm. which means that uh, there are almost n edges incident to u from where we picked each edge to be now with random, with mm. probability one half. So r is like almost like a random graph from a complete, from kn, right? Mm. So this guy really sees uh, all, all of this, many of these were, maybe most of these vertices, probability one half. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. okay. But but it, it's not so simple because maybe u is very large. Mm. Maybe u is like like this. In that case, what we need to do is we need to find the matching here inside u itself. But we can do that okay. uh, anyway. So yeah, yeah. So that's how we extend these matchings. And okay, what's good about this is that after we extend these matchings. Um, any vertex, any vertex now has max degree at most less than n minus k. Because uh, now we still have to maybe color some remaining edges, right? But the good thing is every vertex, maybe roughly speaking, every vertex I appears in, in these matchings because we, at least every high degree vertex appears in these matchings, right? That's what we made sure. U is the high degree vertex. So a high degree vertex appears in k matchings. So a high degree vertex has degree less than n originally. So now it has degree less than n minus k. And low degree vertices originally also have, to start with, they have small degree. So after this, they will still have small degree. Now you apply Wiesing theorem. And you, get, you can color your leftover graph with n minus k colors. Okay, so you used k colors here, mm -hmm. and the leftover graph you color with n minus k colors. So k plus n minus k, you used only n colors. So that's the idea for uh, coloring edges when you're mm -hmm. when, when the edges are bounded. Okay, and and things get more complicated when you allow edges of size. Mm -hmm. <coughs> when you allow large edges, so there I I just want to. Uh, give a rough idea of what we do. So when when edges are large, uh, we basically have uh, so when we also cons have to color the large edges, we basically have two cases. One uh, is if the if these large edges are maybe somehow close to a projective plane, or they are not. Or, or in other words, if the large edges need close to any colors, or not. Maybe less than one minus delta in colors. So somehow you can imagine that this case is that when large edges are kind of like, like the projective plane, like the example that we discussed where every edge has size roughly rooted. And and this case is when you're somehow far from the projective plane. So in this case, uh, roughly speaking, what we do is we can somehow color the large edges first so that each color class of the large edges occupies a small number of vertices, like <coughs> little of n vertices. Like the color class, each co this is not always possible. You, you can immediately think of counterexample, but for most of the color classes, you can make sure that they are actually small, and then we can repeat this argument. So this argument is very robust, because these matchings that you found, uh, you can still find them even avoiding, say, little of n vertices. <coughs> So 
these little offhand vertices are the vertices which are in the large edges. So you use your you color the large edges so that each large edge color class has small number of vertices, a little offhand. So you can then run the semi-random method, this root and label, to find your find these matchings, avoiding this large, avoiding the vertices of this uh, large edge matchings. And then you kind of repeat this argument. So that's mm -hmm. the uh, that's the idea for for how to integrate the large coloring the large edges into uh, how how to integrate coloring the large edges and the small edges. But coloring large edges itself is a, is not a trivial problem. So maybe let me say a few uh, words about it. So now I'm talking about how do we color large edges at all. OK. So what does it mean? So suppose all your hyperedges are of size a large constant, say. A large constant C. So size of every hyperedge is a large constant, then this greedy coloring, which I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, where you uh, start from the large coloring the largest edge, and then the second largest edge, and so on, if you look at it carefully, then actually that gives you a coloring which, sorry, if you're looking at a color, if you're looking at an edge E, the number of other edges that intersect E is almost close to N. So it's pretty good. So if you just use the greedy coloring, then actually you get N plus little of N, which you just have to check how many other edges intersect this edge, which are also larger than E. And you get this. But <coughs> we want to be able to get N, right? Because we want to cover color the large edges with N colors. So what we do is, we want to find an order of the large edges so that every edge intersects only less than n edges before it. If we can manage that, then we can color the large edges with n colors, right? So we want to find some order of your large edges so that every edge intersects only less than n edges before it. And so we try to reorder the edges whenever, in a way that we can, uh, so we can do it. And we argue that if we cannot do it, if we cannot find an ordering so that every edge intersects less than n edges before it, then there has to be some structure in the large edges. So either it has to be close to a projective plane, or the line graph, I mean the graph where we imagine the edges as vertices and connect to two vertices with the corresponding edges. So think of these as vertices now. And whenever two edges meet, connect the corresponding vertices. So that graph is locally sparse. So in the neighborhood of a vertex, you can't have many edges. So that's what locally sparse means. So Using those arguments, so basically, this part reduces to vertex coloring problem, not edge coloring problem. Um, then uh, we can color with them. So basically, this part has to either you're close to a projective plane, or you can color using locally sparse results, coloring locally sparse graphs. OK, so that's the rough sketch for how to color the large edges. And finally, maybe let me mention some yeah. open problems. I think that's the. Oh, can I yeah. ask a quick yeah, question? Sure. So yeah. when you are in this locally sparse graph, it's like, are you coloring it like somewhat greedily? Or is it also? No, no, it's, it's, it's not, not It's not obvious. Yeah, okay. it's, okay. yeah, it's also. I was going to ask, like, if you do it greedily, how can you preserve the randomness for later? But I guess it's yeah. more important. Okay. No, this is completely. Yeah. This we are using some. This this is a very 
heavily studied area also, coloring local as far as graphs. So we're just using some of those results as black box here. OK, so a very nice conjecture of Burge and also independently the Fouletti and Mignon says the following. So the H is a linear hypergraph. And the chromatic index of H is maximum of, of this quantity. So basically, you, you run through all your vertices and you look at the number of vertices in the union of all they are just containing V. So you run through all your vertices V, you look at um, this configuration and see how many <coughs> vertices there are. So this is nice because it, it implies the other schreber lewas conjecture, obviously, uh, and it also implies Wiesing's theorem, right? Because if, if H is a, just a graph, then this quantity is uh, like delta plus one, and so it also Do you works. Mean like size of e minus one. Sorry. Do you mean size of e minus one? No, it's just size of e because it only gives delta plus one. So if you have a graph case, you okay. have delta <laughs> yeah, yeah, plus one. Yeah. That's why for things you can only really say plus one, right? So. So this is wide open, and our methods don't work here because uh, your graph can be very sparse. Because delta can be hypergraph can be just very small degree. It doesn't work. <coughs> the other one is the least EFL conjecture, which says that the least chromatic index, least chromatic index. <coughs> Of any linear hypergraph, then we we'll take linear hypergraph is at most. So it's the same conjecture, but for this chromatic number instead of normal chromatic number, normal chromatic index, least chromatic index. So it basically, <coughs> every hyper edge has a list of size n, um, and the question is, can you? assign a color from its list so that your hypergraph is properly colored. That's what we will that's also open. Yeah. Okay, I think that's where I'll stop. Question: What what is the n? How how big is the graph? It's it's very big because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we use many probabilistic estimates, and there's also like a part of the proof where we need to use regularity lemma, which maybe we can avoid it. We didn't try too hard, but uh, because of it, n is huge. This may be a pretty general question. So mm -hmm. obviously this paper is very technical and also what was maybe in your opinion the most technical or difficult part, uh, like which issue to resolve? Uh, the difficult part? Uh, I don't know. It's hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> but what was the last piece? Like when did you realize that this is completed? We never uh, realized, we never <laughs> we, we kept feeling maybe something is wrong. But uh, yeah, I mean, basically, they, we kept working around this idea, right? Because we tried to like take care of the graph, high degree vertices um, using graph theory. Try to use graph theory as much as possible rather than hypergraph theory, because we don't know much about hypergraphs, color hypergraphs. <laughs> and there are many like uh, uh, little issues that I didn't tell you about like 
So when you're extending it, you can't find a perfect match in when your n is odd. Maybe you, you, you leave out one vertex here. And you have to make sure that the le vertex that you leave out here is not left out by anyone else. Because if you left out, left out a vertex many times, then you can't make sure that uh, at the end of degree is low. So these kind of things make, uh, make things technical. But the basic idea is simple. Is there any difficulty in handling? You, so you gave a very kind of sketch of how to handle the very high degree vertices, but you didn't say anything about things where the degrees, say, between um, k and 1 minus f sometimes. Yeah, that's a good point. So basically, because these hypergra these matchings are produced using rudal label or some semi semi random process, mm -hmm. automatically vertices are kind of well distributed, so th these even before you extend anything, these matchings are already kind of random-like. So they kind of ca contain vertices, uh, like the slow degree vertices, many of the times. So if you account for the fact that, uh, say, a vertex of degree less than this is is already in many of these matchings, maybe not all of them, but say most of these matchings, and so outside when you remove these matchings. You're going to get the max degree less than n minus k. So, kind of low degree vertices, you don't need to worry about too much because of the randomness of this. this you're matches. not using this as a black box at all. It's the Pippinger Spencer theorem, you really Yeah, we don't use it as a black box. Yeah. So no, we can't. We have to actually run the. Mm -hmm. run it. Yes. Actually, you can remove any f any any no any edges you want, as long as they are not too many. Mm. I think it's like uh, something like less than n half or something. Very yeah, right. Yeah, right. there there is okay. So yes. there, yeah, there are many very many graphs without it much structure, so as long as they're close. But do you, like. Is there a conjecture, com or is there a complete oh, list? Oh, I see, complete characterization. Yeah, yeah, is it, or is it like completely hopeless to, I don't know. We, we thought about it, we were not sure like what, what to convince us. <laughs> we don't know, maybe if there are more examples, it would be interesting, but we don't know. Maybe there are some, actually maybe not, there are some examples, there may be, there may be more examples actually. Yeah, if I, I have to think for yeah. <coughs> Okay, uh, maybe we can continue asking him over the dinner. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so let's thank the speaker. <laughs> <laughs>